I should turn that on. <laughs> well, good morning, church. How's everyone today? What a beautiful day it is outside, and uh, we have a full temptation tray again this morning. It was, it was actually a lot fuller than that, but some of us some of submitted us to temptation. <laughs> and so therefore, yes, I did. but uh, Lori's sister dropped by and, and brought more temptation in this morning, so it filled it right back up, so it's kind of cool, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That will explain why the keys are all sticking. Oh, 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 is that what it? Oh, you've got one. So you have to tell us what it's like. Oh, 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 oh,
and it always really kind of brings it home at that point in time. So let's go to God in prayer and start our time of worship this morning. Gracious Lord, thank you for this beautiful day today. Thank you for the opportunity to gather here as your children, as a family of God. Father God, you are at the head of the family, and, and we are your children, and we need to make sure that in everything that we say and everything that we do, that we bring honor and glory to you. So we call upon the Holy Spirit to come and guide us, guide our hearts, guide our tongues, guide our entire existence to follow you more closely. Lord, as we come into this time of worship, we, we ask a special prayer for Pastor Terry as he gives a message that you've laid upon his heart. Uh, to give to us today and to share with us today and we praise you and thank you for that and the anointing that you've given him Lord God, we are just in an awesome place today and I just feel the the spirit is in this room with us and I thank you for that today Lord Jesus, we bring all these things to you and in your name we pray today Amen As we go into our call to worship this morning, it comes from Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, and this is the New Living Translation. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole or made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed, and all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. So as we talked about last week and, and last Wednesday as we were leading up into the cross and we were leading that path to from betrayal then to the cross itself, we actually were listening to this as they were playing it out on the screen for us. So here God points to salvation. He points to atonement for the sins of all for all time. We need to understand that this sacrifice was a once and done for everyone. For everyone. Isaiah points us to a loving, a suffering servant, as we talked about last week, whom God would provide as an atonement for our sins and for all sin, for all people. God created all people, and as he sent Jesus into the world, he didn't send them just for one group. He sent them for everyone. Jews, Gentiles alike. The New Testament, New Testament then identifies Jesus as the Christ. And in Greek and in Hebrew, that means the anointed one. God sent his anointed one, his son. Not just anyone, but Jesus the Christ. We always think of him as Jesus and his last name is Christ, but that's not what it is. Jesus the Christ, the anointed one sent by God for the atonement for our sins. And so the New Testament that goes further than what was said in the Old Testament under Isaiah, and it tells us who Jesus was, why he was here, what his purpose was for being here, and why God sent him. Jesus was sent because of the sinful nature of God's people. He was sent here because of sin. And because sin was a universal nature to all peoples, Jews and Gentiles alike, we were all born unclean. This morning we were walking, working in the kitchen in there, and Terry's up here and he swipes up and he's pointing. And I was thinking he was going to start saying, unclean, unclean. But he found a spider web, and so he was going to the spider web. <laughs> well, I, I was sweating that one for a minute. So we were there because we all have a sinful nature. We all need to be cleansed. We all are unclean. See how I say like that? Yeah. Cool. So God sends Jesus instead of the wrath of God coming down like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah. He sends instead unexpected love. Love instead of wrath which then shocks us into confessing our sins, a repentance for those sins, a return to godliness because of his son Jesus. So Jesus then calls us to repent and to turn to God. He brings compassion. He brings empathy. He brings healing. 
and acceptance to the lost and the least who were rejected by the, the very leaders who were supposed to be reaching out and helping those people. We talked about that, those groups, the, the Jewish high council, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were rejecting the people because they thought everyone except themselves was unclean. So, you know, according to Jewish law, they couldn't have anything to do with the very people they were there to serve. But instead, they made the people serve them. They kind of got the wrong idea of what they were here for. So then when Jesus comes, we gaze upon the face of the suffering servant. And our only response is that we belong to a dumb race, which all have followed the leaders into sin and destruction. It's dumb. God brought all kinds of signs, wonders, people, judges, kings, to turn the people back to a godly race. And we're just dumb. We missed the point that whole time. So he sends Jesus. We followed our own path instead of following our Father in heaven. That is the essence of sin. So God sends his only son not to judge the world, but to bring salvation, restitution, restoration to his people and to the, re the relationship they have to God. Amen. Amen. Amen? Thank you, Lord God, that you bring us these messages and that you put upon Terry for this call to worship this morning, which points us to why you sent your one and only son to die on a cross, to save us, to be that atonement for our sin and for our sinful nature. Thank you, Lord God, for sending the Holy Spirit upon us as we accept Christ into our lives, that we might dwell with you each and every day and therefore turn for our sinful ways and sin no more. Not condemnation, but I'm being eternal love. Thank you, Lord God. The only way to get by that tray is to focus on the cross. <laughs> <laughs> And Mark, to your point, if I was pointing at you, remember the old thing? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I remember no, I, not pointing at you. That was in a sermon back in like 2018. Yeah. Yes, it was. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I don't know about y'all, but I hope you can get out and enjoy this weekend. It is absolutely beautiful. And I know Mark's uh, officiating a wedding this afternoon, and it is going to be a glorious day for that. So praise God. Well, last week, Mark took us on a journey to betrayal. And today, we're going to take that journey from betrayal with some overlap, because you just can't get through that without bringing them together. And it's like the, the scriptures from beginning to Genesis to Revelation, it all is woven together. But as I was thinking about where this starts, a betrayal, I was thinking about, have you ever been thrown under the bus? I have, and it's worse when it's someone you know. It hurts more. But then I got to think, have you ever been treated as though you didn't even exist? I've watched it happen again and again. I've seen it happen to someone very personal to me and very close to me. And it not only injured them, but it hurt me as well. Now, while it shouldn't, I am still amazed at how people can treat others as if they don't exist, or as if they are less than human. But it continues to happen over and over again. And sometimes people are treated as though they're invisible, like they don't, like they're not even there. And people you even know People you may have thought you were a friend with. You get into a certain situation and all of a sudden it's like you're wearing the same patterned clothing as the wall and you just melt in. 
regardless of that scenario, you have to wonder what's going through that person's mind. Why are they being like that? Why are they treating others like that? And when it happens to you, you start wondering, I thought they were my friend. Do they even care about me? Was it a friendship or was it a sham? As Mark took us through the journey to betrayal last week, I don't know I felt different. I, I, I left, a lot of times I'll leave here, I'm built up and feeling really good and ready to go out and hit the world and, and just take on whatever comes at me. But I left here with this weight. And that weight hung for a few days, actually. And it wasn't because I wasn't spending time with God. It wasn't because I wasn't focusing where I needed to focus. There was something in that message that just kind of, was like a gut punch. And whether you're thrown under the bus or being ignored, they're both being betrayed. Both hurt, both leave emotional scars. Both make it hard to trust again. And trust me when I say this, I'm not playing on the words here, but trust me when I say this, once you lose someone's trust, it goes away that quickly and it takes months or years to rebuild. Some people are motivated to act this way by what they can get out of something. Maybe they're treating you poorly because they have a goal. They have something, their eye on a, the eyes on the prize. They're, they've got their eye on something and they're going to go after it and they're going to walk on and trample on anyone and everyone around them to get where they want to be. And the only word that comes to mind at that point is greed. <clears throat> Sometimes it's fear of what <laughs> others think. But again, still betrayal. So Judas, he hands over, he gets 30 pieces of silver to hand over Jesus to the religious leaders. And it wasn't something that he just did randomly. He didn't just decide at that moment, you know what? I can use that money. I'm going to go and betray Jesus. It just didn't happen overnight. Things like that don't. It's something that had been growing and growing and growing over time. And the hard part for many is that Judas had been with Jesus and the other disciples now for three years. He'd heard the teaching. He'd watched Jesus in action, and he'd even been sent out, given the same power as the other disciples, to preach and teach and heal. How could he possibly betray Jesus like he did? Now, number one, his heart wasn't right. He just wasn't focused on what was truly important. He was not focused on Christ. He was focused on himself and what he could get out of what he probably saw as an opportunity. Jesus says, come join this, come join us. And he's thinking, hmm, they might have some money. I might be able to get my paws on some of that. And then, not ironically, he ends up in charge of their money. He's, you know, Let's just give them two for you, one for me, three for you, one for me. He skimmed it off for himself. But as time went on, he realized that he wasn't going to get rich at this point because they weren't bringing in a ton of money. So he took to other schemes. And then, well, that love of money kicks in. Paul reminds us in 1 Timothy 6 that it's, not, it's the love of money, not the money itself, that is the root of all kinds of evil. 
Judas longed to be rich. And he definitely fell into temptation. I mean, you give someone who is addicted to something the very thing that they're addicted to and say, don't touch this. Give your kids some candy. But, oh, by the way, you know, there's lots of videos online. Parents will sit a child at a table, put a bowl of M&Ms or something else in front of them, say, don't eat any until I get back, and then they have like an anti cam on them. Some kids, they make it. I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> kind of hard. Our neighbor next door, we have to go in there to do the heat and cooling in here. And for about a month, right in front here, towards the front, they had this little bowl and it was full of Starburst. <laughs> time I went back, oh, hey, this look good. Keep walking, go. Not my Starburst. It was the love of money, though, that would lead him to his demise. I have to imagine that the straw that broke the camel's back was what happened just before he went to see the chief priest. So if we go back to the Gospels, they tell us that just before Passover, Jesus was in Bethany at a dinner that was given in his honor. A woman would anoint his feet with a very expensive jar of perfume. And Judas, being Judas, was not happy. And we see a glimpse of his heart, where he truly has his heart at, in John chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, where he says, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. And at that time, a year's wages would have been about 300 denarii. <clears throat> that would have been quite the bump to the treasury. And to Judas's pocket. Judas likely left that meal, kind of like a little kid having a fit. And he went, straight to the chief priest. So let's pick it up, Matthew 26, verses 14 and 19. If you have your Bible, you can pick that up at page 739. If anybody wants one, I just closed it, but you can have it. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. It was premeditated. <coughs> By contrast, 30 pieces of silver was worth about 120 denarii. It's about a third of the year's salary. Now, as money hungry as this dude was, I'm really surprised he didn't negotiate. Why didn't he get in there and negotiate? I don't know, maybe 30 pieces of silver is enough. Maybe let's talk 60. But he didn't. He just ultimately decided for 30 pieces of silver he was going to throw Jesus under the bus. That's one of the betrayals that happens in this time frame. Peter would betray Jesus too. He would deny he even knew him. Jesus told him that he would do that. He told him that before the rooster crowed that Peter would deny him three times. But Matthew 26, 35, Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Peter knew what the Romans were capable of. That's going to play into it here shortly. He knew how brutal they were. Matthew 26, 41, Jesus tells him, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's one thing to say you can or will do something. It's something altogether to go through with it. Wow, 
it's been 25 years ago, I decided to go get a slip of paper that says that I could work on computers. And I started interviewing with different places. I interviewed uh, with the company that actually hosts our website. I interviewed with this one guy, I think his name was Mark. He had some computer business of his own. I can even, I literally, we were talking, Mark and I actually were talking about it. I said, I walked in the front door, I turned right, right through the office door and then your office was up against the wall of the building next mm -hmm. to you. I remembered that over 20 years later. Can't see his face in it, but I can. Re I remember things like directions and such. Well, ultimately, I didn't get that job, but I did get one with that host, that website host. Yeah, I even turned in my two weeks notice. I was excited. And then that four-letter word popped in my head, and I was scared out of my mind, because I knew what I was doing when I was working for Hardee's. I had no idea what I was going to be doing working for GoDaddy. So I called up the owner. I said, hey, Lee, yeah, can we tear that up? He goes, sure, I haven't hired anybody to replace you. Cool. Threw it away. And then fear kicked in again. That, do I really want to stay here? Do I really want to keep doing this? And I ended up landing a job with the telecommunications company. Fear plays into every part of our lives. It can dramatically change where we're going. Here's the important part of what Jesus was telling Peter, James, and John. Something I didn't do before I took, accepted the job at GoDaddy and turned in my resignation. I didn't pray. Jesus is telling them to pray. He's in the garden. He's telling them to pray because you will fall into temptation because even though the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And by falling asleep, they did not have time to pray. They didn't have time to pray for that strength that they were about to need for what was about to happen. That's why we read in Ephesians 6, Paul says, put on the full armor of God every day. First thing, get up, put it on. If we don't, we run the serious risk of being devoured by Satan, who, as Peter writes, and it's Interesting that Peter writes this, but he writes this in 1 Peter 5 and 8. He says that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If we are not spiritually set and ready, the flesh is weak. Peter did not follow or excuse me, Peter did follow Jesus, but once he was confronted by his fears. He denied Jesus. Human weakness and fear brought him right back to knowing what the Romans were capable of. Have you ever denied someone more than a group of others just because they may not have the same beliefs as you? It was easy for Peter to be bold when he was amongst Jesus and the disciples. I'll never deny you. And then he ends up in that courtyard. And it's a whole different situation. Once he saw how Jesus was being treated, human nature, fear, they all kicked in, and he denied Jesus yet again. And just as so many of us do when asked the third time, Peter's old ways kicked in. And he didn't just deny Jesus, he got mad. Have you ever confronted somebody or asked somebody something and that, you, that fear wells up in them and they, they just get mad and they start yelling. And in his case, he called down curses on himself if he was lying. But then, and I, in, in 
the video, we saw his eyes as he looks at Jesus. Then he heard the rooster crow and he remembered mm -hmm. what Jesus had told him. And he was immediately filled with remorse. Both Peter and Judas betrayed Jesus, but with a difference. Peter left that courtyard and he wept, realizing what he had done, and he was repentant. Passion Translation puts it this way from Matthew 26, 75. With a shattered heart, Peter left the courtyard sobbing with bitter tears. He immediately knew what he had done and he was sorry. He knew what he had done was wrong. He remembered what Jesus said. He remembered what he said. Judas, he would realize what he had done. He would take the 30 pieces of silver back, and as it says in Matthew 27, 4, he said, I have sinned, for I betrayed innocent blood. But what did he do next? He wasn't sorrowful. He wasn't repentant. He, just, he was depending on himself. Peter would continue the work of Jesus while Judas would go out and take his own life. And I said this last week after Mark's sermon as we were getting ready for communion, and I'll say it again today, I can't get over the feeling that I am betraying Jesus every time that I sin. There is good news. We do have a Savior and Father in Heaven who forgives. But it's not about feeling bad when we sin, it's what we do next. Do we do like Judas and just go off and have a pity party and forget God? Or do we realize what we've done, we repent and we let the Holy Spirit work within us? This was the end for Judas, but it was the beginning for Peter. The things that happen next to Jesus are absolutely unthinkable. And I, tr I can truly understand why Peter felt that fear and why he denied Jesus. The Jewish leaders had charged, tried, and pronounced judgment on Jesus in the dark of night behind closed doors. And we talked about that on Wednesday night. They were bound and determined to do whatever they had to do to get rid of this Jesus, even if it meant breaking their own laws and the commandments. Once they had done that, with no remorse, they took Jesus to Pilate. So let's pick up this story in Matthew 27 and verse 11 where it says, Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answers. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply. Not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. The lies and the deceit would continue. So religious leaders would accuse Jesus of different charges than what they had arrested him for. They had to make those charges mean something to the Romans, since their charges would have been meaningless to them. They may have to say that Jesus tried to encourage the people not to pay taxes. Well, if you remember your scriptures, you remember Jesus saying, whose image is on the coin? Caesar's? Well, then give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. So we already know this is a lie. And, and they said that he claimed to be a king. Well, Caesar's the king. And that, they could get around that. And that he had caused riots. Well, he didn't cause any riots. He threw over some tables because of the things that were happening in the temple. 
waiting causing riots. They would literally break several of the commandments and their own laws in their zeal to have Jesus killed. To get rid of this guy who was causing us trouble, get in the way of us having the life that we currently have, because don't mess with our life. I like my life and you ain't messing with it. And by the time they had finished, they had that crowd so wound up, whether the crowd believed what they were saying or not, they had them so wound up that what did they say? They yelled, crucify him. And they said it over and over and over. And after this, well, Pilate would release Barabbas and had Jesus flogged and then he handed him over to be crucified. The Roman soldiers would be rape, mock, and flog at Jesus. So let's go to verse 28. It says, They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and they led him away to be crucified. Now here's the thing. That flogging, that's not just a light <clears throat> whipping. It's not just... No. This whip, this, this instrument had between like 3 and 12 different strands of leather on it. And in those strands, they had metal balls woven into the leather. That's leading down to the tip, and at the tip was anything that would cut flesh bone, glass, shards of metal, nails, whatever they could find to make it hurt. So what Jesus' back looked like after he was flogged, I'm going to leave that to your own imagination, or if you've seen it, uh, look in pictures, you, you have an idea. And then, well, we have to understand that flogging, flogging can be an instrument of itself that results in death. This would bring and fulfill the prophecy coming from Isaiah 50, verse 6. that said, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. You know, the, this is the interesting part. Those soldiers that were mocking him and mockingly bowing before him, and yeah, one day, just like the rest of us, they're going to get a surprise because they're going to truly bow down before Jesus and proclaim that he is Lord. Now, normally victims of Roman torture would carry their own crosses, but in this case, they forced Simon of Cyrene to do it. It doesn't say this in the scriptures, but as brutal as the Romans were, as bad as that flogging could just destroy a person, as evil as they were with this flogging, and the, then the crucifixion, I have to wonder if they thought, yeah, he, we almost beat him to death, but we want to make sure he dies on that cross, so let's get this guy. You, here, carry this for him. Just so that they could finish him on the cross. I don't know about you, but that to me is sick and demented. <sighs> but I could see it as something that might have been transpiring. <clears throat> Crucifixion in and of itself, it had been around for well, hundreds of years. In one article I read while I was preparing it, said it went all the way back to the 6th century BC. Okay, so now we're talking about 600 years of, excuse me, 4th century BC. So, 400 years, it's like 200 years is going to make a difference in it, right? It had been going on that long, and it wasn't the Romans that started, because they, had, they weren't in power yet, but it had been worked its way through. So by the time the Romans were doing it, they were pretty darn good at it, and that's sad to say, but they were. More of Isaiah's prophecies are about to come to fruition. This 
passage that Mark read this morning from our call to worship, where he says, he, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. We just read all of that. And as I was reading this and as I was sending it to Mark and I was thinking about it, it's almost like these are backwards. Because verse 6 says, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. What had happened before all of this? He was betrayed. And the disciples, they all fell away when he was arrested. Jesus, and this is where we're getting to the path. Jesus faced the penalty for the sins of each and every person who has lived, is living, and is yet to be born. He didn't deserve it, but he took on that penalty willingly. The sheer agony Jesus would have felt. Is it any wonder what happened next? Pick it up and chapter 27 at verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and grabbed a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. Now, I'll stop right there. You remember when Jesus was told on Fall Sunday to make your... your Followers be quiet, and he said, even if they are quiet, the rocks will cry out. The rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. The words that Jesus spoke at the very beginning here, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They are direct fulfillment of chapter 22 of Psalm. Psalm 22, 1. Jesus had been since eternity, and in this moment, that connection was So remember when we talked about if you've ever felt abandoned, ever felt betrayed, denied, felt like you didn't exist. In that very moment, Jesus experienced the abandonment of the Father, who he had been with since eternity. God poured out his wrath, all of his wrath, on Jesus for the sins of the world, past, present, future. Now, we're gonna drop back to chapter to chapter 26 and look at Jesus' prayers. And what did he say? He said, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then in verse 42, <laughs> He says, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And each time going back to the disciples, finding them asleep, they had not been praying like he told them to. They were not spiritually ready for the warfare about to happen. And when he went back the third time, he prayed the same prayers. Not my will, but your will. Jesus suffered both a physical and just moments before that, a spiritual death. The people mistakenly thought Jesus was calling on Elijah. 
Because if you remember, Elijah had ascended into heaven without dying. And to give a little context to this, during Passover, the people would set a place for Elijah at the meal, anticipating, expectant of his return. But then Jesus cried out and gave up his spirit. John records it saying, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The scriptures had been fulfilled. Jesus' work had been accomplished. He was the final sacrifice. Fulfilling the words spoken by John the Baptist in John 1, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Sacrificing of animals, that was just a temporary measure. If it weren't temporary, they wouldn't have had to have kept doing it over and over and over. Jesus was the final sacrifice. And by believing in him as Lord and Savior, we are made righteous in God's eyes. And don't forget, as Jesus cried out, what happened? The curtain tore from top. It's important that this is recorded this way, from top to bottom. Now we think of a curtain, we think of our living room or our bedroom, and it's this high, and you can grab it and open and close it and do whatever. No. This curtain separated the holy place where only the priests could enter with the most holy place where only the high priest could enter and only once a year. It is believed that this curtain was 60 feet tall. Now, I don't know about you, that's going to take some scaffolding because ain't no ladder going to reach that. And according to Jewish tradition, not only was it 60 feet tall, it was four inches thick. You know, we see those, those uh, well, okay, we got to go back about 20 years when they used to do it, but the, uh, the strong men, they would take the, that phone book and they'd rip it in half. This was ripped from top to bottom, 60 feet, four inches thick, only something that could have happened by God's hand. And by the hand of God, our Father in heaven, the curtain being torn removed any barrier that remained between himself and us. And I'm a tech guy. I like watching some sci-fi. And so the very first thing I thought of was this little sign that says, Access Granted. In a mere instant, the moment Jesus gives up his spirit after saying it is finished, we are granted access. And not just conditional access, full access to God's holy presence through Jesus. And it was such a powerful event that the Roman centurion, as well as those around him, exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. What they don't realize is that it's not past tense. It should have been, surely he is the Son of God. And we've all been treated poorly. We've all been treated as if we don't exist. Know that Jesus loves you. He proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt on the cross. We have all suffered and felt like no one had any idea of what we are going through right now. But Jesus can relate. He understands your suffering more than anything you can possibly imagine because we can't even imagine the suffering he went through, not just in the flogging, not just in being nailed on the cross, but when he was separated from the Father. Have you lost all hope? Jesus' death on the cross is where we get our hope. Joseph of Arimathea, well, he was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, and he had objected to what had been done to Jesus, as several of the other had. But those in power, they got their way. Joseph knew Jesus loved him. Joseph knew and saw the suffering that Jesus endured, 
and he had hope of what Jesus was offering. And because of that, he became a disciple. Because of this, he wanted to honor Jesus in death. So he went to Pilate. He asked for Jesus' body and then placed it in his own new tomb, never used, empty tomb. The tomb would be sealed and guarded for now. Father God, thank you for that even when we are at our worst and we do things that we shouldn't do, that you offer us that gift. You offer us your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness, and most assuredly, assuredly your love. You made a way for us, allowing your only Son to come and live a sinless life, bear our sins, and die on the cross and be separated from you. But Father, we have hope because he has risen and he is sitting at your right hand intercessing for us right now. And we thank you for that, Father. And as we prepare to close out today, uh, Father, I am looking forward to hearing more about what happens after the for now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we prepare for a time of communion, as we come together in remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, if we remember Wednesday night and, and we uh, go back into the scriptures and it talks about how Caiaphas, the high priest, upon Jesus telling him and answering his question, says, are you the son of God? And he says, I am. And through me all has been fulfilled. And what did Caiaphas do? When you blaspheme God, the priest will tear the robes from top to bottom. The unpardonable sin, blaspheming God. So what was God telling them when that temple curtain was torn in two from the top to the bottom? The priests had blasphemed God. No need for you anymore. You're done. Your reign of terror is over. It is finished. There is so much in there that people um, kind of breeze past and they don't understand. But those priests, those elders that commit, that lied against Jesus to have him crucified, they did, didn't want him dispatched, as they said. Done away with in the dark night. They wanted him to endure suffering, the most brutal kind of suffering known to man at the time. And then God tore the temple curtain from top to bottom. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise in the meal he took the cup and after he had filled it he blessed it and he said this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So today as we partake of the bread and of the cup I want you to interject your own name in there as we're taking the bread. The body of Christ broken for me. The blood of Christ shed for me. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's time for prayers for the people. Is there anyone that would like to ask for prayer this morning? Okay. Well, I have a lot. But <laughs> okay. Let's pray. Father, we come into your house to lift up praise to you, Lord, to honor you for Psalms 84, 1 and 2. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. For you are merciful in all your ways, and your steadfast love to us endures forever. In Psalms 86, 11 and 12. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. We praise you today for who you are. And in Revelations 4, part 8 and 11, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You created man in your image to worship and honor you in prayer. Therefore, as we pray for your people today, bring the Holy Spirit in this house to rest among us, Lord, to hear our prayers. Help us to be a people that read your word and humble ourselves before you so that you will hear and answer our prayers and you will walk with us through all the trials of this world. We now lift up Amanda and Kelly to you, Father God. You have heard their cries and pleas for help with their afflictions. I ask that you hear our prayers for healing of their bodies. Though they are in the fight of their lives, May you hold them in your hands and guide them through the valley back to health. You are God, and with all things, with you are possible. Father God, I lift up my friend Jean McGee's family. She came home to you Thursday after fighting pancreatic cancer. I ask for the peace that passes all understanding to be with them in their time of need. Help them to find you as each day unfolds. Help them to know you are, they are loved by you. And Father, I pray for all who are online and who are here suffering from cancer, illnesses, anxiety, depression, or COVID. Help each and every one of them to call on your name for their help with you, through you, for their help with all things with you, Lord Jesus. Help them to understand your love for them as it says, Isaiah 49, 13, Shout for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth, burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. So let us not stop calling on your holy name for help. You are Yahweh Suri, the Lord, my rock. Though you, Through you and by you all things move for our benefit. Father God, bless your people. And Father, I continue to call on your name to protect and guide our children and grandchildren daily, that they might know the fear of the Lord and your amazing grace that abounds to all who find you. Guide our homeless daily, that they will seek to rise above their situations. Bless them in their trials. Help them to know that they are loved by God and they are still loved by everyone around them. We praise you and thank you, Jesus, for the blood you shed on the cross and your unconditional love for all mankind. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. amen. Now as we prepare to end our online portion of our service, for those of you watching online, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Diane, you want to hit the enter key and you know, put that link to the mess or the music in one more time. Uh, but if it, you don't get it, it's just Grace Street Not Church. Click on messages. It's right there at the top. You can click on it. I can tell you that selecting music was not easy. I even went to Diane. She said, I got you down to these seven. <laughs> 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 
I got it down a little bit further. There's just a lot of tremendous worship music out there that talks about Christ's passion for us. So as we leave this portion, I leave you with the blessing that the Lord gave to Moses, telling Aaron and his sons that this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you, Father, for giving us.